If you'll take a look inside of your bulletin and pull out the insert that you find there, those are your sermon notes for today, and they contain all the scriptures that we'll be looking at, and the scriptures will also be on the screens. We start a brand new sermon series for this new year entitled, Why Does the Church Exist? And I want to address this question to clarify in our minds what our purpose is as the body of Christ. Why are we here as a church? Why are we in Flowery Branch at this moment in time as a congregation? What are we to do on a regular basis? What does God expect us, of us as his people, his body, and his congregation? So we need to look at these questions and answer them from a biblical perspective. It's also good to remind ourselves of our purpose as a church as we start a brand new year. Our memory verse is from Matthew 16, 18, uh, something that Jesus said. You may know this verse already in a different translation. That's okay, but let's say it together. Will you say it with me? On this rock I will build my church, and death itself will have no power over it. Matthew 16, 18. I got a little confused here. I'm used to it in a different translation myself. But Jesus makes it clear that he will do what? He will build his church. And the church belongs to who? It belongs to Jesus. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is also the chief cornerstone. So he owns the church, he's the chief cornerstone, and he is the builder. And he makes the statement, there is nothing that will have any power over his church. Not even death itself will stop the church of Jesus Christ. When you and I die, our faith in Christ continues on. Our souls continue on. It, they last forever. And because Jesus is the builder of his church, the church itself will never die. Individual congregations die every week, don't they? We hear about that, and it's sad. Individual congregations start brand new every week. New churches are started all the time. However, the church, as a spiritual congregation, will never die. The living body of Jesus Christ will never die. Every government in the entire world will eventually pass away. And you said to that, amen. <laughs> Every nation will eventually disappear. Every organization from the Boy Scouts to the Kiwanis Clubs, from local preschools to major universities, medical clinics and hospitals, Hollywood and its red carpet, all sports organizations and the money that goes with them will all disappear. The only thing that will be left will be the church. The church is not an organization, it is a living organism. The church is not a business, it is the body of Christ. And since Jesus is the church founder and builder, it will last forever. So if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, and if you are in the family and in the church, then you will last forever with the church. The church is the only entity that has no ending to it. Death itself, as our memory verse says, will have no power over Jesus' church. So since the church is the only entity that's going to last forever, that will endure forever, then as Christians, we ought to be willing to pay, place our full commitment of time and energy and money into God's church and into God's kingdom. It is the only commitment that we can make that will have lasting results. So as Jesus then builds his church, what are we to do? Or do we just sit back and be supervisors? No. <laughs> the Bible is very clear. Jesus gives us clear direction on what we are to do. So for the next several weeks, we're going to look at five different purposes of the church, answering this question, why do we exist? And here's the first one, part one today. The church exists to celebrate God's presence. And it comes from the most basic command in the Bible. Look at your notes with me. Let's look at the command. And each week, we're going to start with the command of Jesus about these purposes. 
The command comes from Matthew chapter 22, and it is to love God. That is the most basic purpose we have, to love God, to celebrate his presence. Jesus says there in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The religious leaders were asking Jesus a trick question. What's the greatest commandment? And they already knew that. So he quoted from the Old Testament law. He quoted the verse that they had memorized, that you and I have memorized, the most important command to love God with our entire being. This verse is rich with meaning. It's made its way into several songs that sometimes we sing. Why are we here on earth? We are here to love God. We are here to celebrate his presence. We are here to give him praise and glory and honor. The reason that we can love God is because God loved us first. God came to us first with his presence and he chose to love us. And in return, we are to celebrate his presence with us and return his love to him, love him back. Loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, that is a way to celebrate God. It is a way to celebrate his presence. It is a way to celebrate his word that is with us. It is a way to celebrate his work and service among us. The church exists to celebrate the presence of God. That's why we're gathered here this morning on this New Year's Day. We are celebrating his presence. Many of you have been a part of a military unit that has left the country and you've gone off to serve somewhere in the military. Some of you have seen that. It's a very sad time to see uh, spouses saying goodbye to their spouse and children saying goodbye to their parents as the military goes off for service. However, when they come back, there is a homecoming celebration. The military is back with us. We're celebrating their presence. And several of you have perhaps participated in that type of homecoming celebration for military. It's a great time. Well, we do not have the physical presence of Jesus Christ with us as his followers did some 2,000 years ago when he was here as God in the flesh walking upon the earth. But we do have his spiritual presence with us. And God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We have his presence with us all the time. So we are to celebrate his presence Every day, here on Sunday, Monday through Saturday, every day, God is with us. We can celebrate his presence. That's why we are here on earth. Now, what does that look like? Look at section two with me, if you will, on your sermon notes there. How do we love God? How do we celebrate his presence? Thankfully, the Bible gives us several ways of doing that, several ideas of doing that. And I want to share with you four of them. And if you've looked ahead, they spell out the word what? Love. I'm so smart, Anna. I can figure that out. Uh, you're probably getting tired of those kind of sermon notes anyway. But let's look at the first one. L stands for love. Oh, excuse me. L stands for listen. We are to listen to God. If we want to celebrate his presence and express our love to him, we are to listen to him. This passage was read a moment ago. It's one of my favorite scriptures from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. And here's why. Go near to listen rather than to do what? Offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. Those instructions are so clear, aren't they? I don't have to explain them to you. You can understand that for yourself. Normally, when we come here for worship, we come ready to sing. We come ready to pray. We come ready to shout hallelujahs to God. We come really ready to tell God all of our problems. That's what celebrating God is about, but it is also listening to him. Celebrating God's presence means listening. 
Go near to listen, it says, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. I believe listening to God is one of the more difficult spiritual disciplines that we struggle with. If we are honest about it, we struggle with listening to God. We know how to go near to God to pray. We know how to go near to God to whine and complain. We're good at that one, aren't we? We know how to go near to God to ask, to shout, to sing, and to praise. But when it comes to listening, we often struggle with that. One day, a pastor was preaching with many words, as this verse says. He was preaching with a lot of words, and he realized that no one in the congregation was paying attention. So, he opened up his Hebrew Bible and began reading Scripture in Hebrew. And suddenly, everyone's paying attention. <laughs> and he then commented to his congregation how sad it was that they were paying attention to words they couldn't possibly understand, but refused to pay attention to words that were easily understandable. God has so much to say to us. Why? Because he loves us, he created us, he died for us. He has so much he wants to say to us. He knows our name. He knows how many hairs are on our head. And he wants to tell us over and over how much he loves us. We're to celebrate that presence. We're to celebrate that love by listening to him and listening to what he has to say. How do we listen to God? We can listen to God by reading his scripture. We can listen to God through a time of prayer. We can listen to God by Listening to someone else read scripture. Perhaps you have an audio Bible that you like to listen to in your car from time to time or in your home. You can listen to God through uh, a sermon or a Bible study. You can listen to God as you go to counseling for some reason. You go to a Christian counselor. You're trying to understand God's will. Our responsibility is to listen to God in all of the variety of ways that he chooses to speak to us. When we listen to God, we're demonstrating our love to him, our respect to him, our honor of him. So that's one way we can celebrate his presence. Look at the O with me. The O stands for obey. So we're going to celebrate God's presence. We're going to demonstrate our love. We listen to him. And secondly, we want to obey his commands. Follow along as I read from 2 John chapter 1, verse 6. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. And you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. If you've ever read this bef verse before, you know that it goes in a circle. So it, the instruction tells us we are to do what? We are to love. And what does love mean? It means walking in obedience to his command. And what is his command? to love. <laughs> it goes in a circle, doesn't it? So this verse also is easy to understand. But in a similar way that we often forget to listen to God, we also forget to obey God. But that too is an expression of our love and obedience to him, as this verse points out. Love, walk in obedience to his command, and to love him. It goes in that circle. The instruction it's very clear, very simple. So as we gather here for worship, and we sing and we praise and we pray, we are also to obey what God is speaking to our hearts. Without obedience, our love is worthless. Without obedience, our love to God is fake. How can we say, I love you, and not be willing to obey him? The verse points that out. Jesus told us at the end of his Sermon on the Mount that if we take his words and put them into practice, in other words, if we obey them, we are building our house on what? The rock. But if we take his words and we ignore them, if we don't obey them, if we don't put them into practice, we're building our house on sand. So it makes sense. We are to obey him. We are to take what he tells us Listen to it and then obey it. James had this, this way, faith without works is, 
is dead. So trying to love without obedience is dead. It's worthless. It's false. It's fake. Even in my sermons, I try my best to make sure that there is application here in the points, that it's something for us to do, to put into practice. And so today we're looking at four ideas of how to celebrate God's presence. Obeying God's commands, that is an expression of our love to him. Now, look with me at a third way we can celebrate God's presence. The V stands for voice our thanks to him. Follow along as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean we're to thank God for evil or to thank God for diseases or to thank God for bad things happening to us, but it means that in all of those circumstances of life, God's presence is where? It's with us, so we give thanks for God's presence in all circumstances. When life is bad, when life is hard, God still loves, he still cares, he still heals, he still works things out for our good. God is always worthy of our praise and our love and our thanks, no matter what the circumstances. Again, we're celebrating his presence, and so we can give thanks to God in all circumstances. In my prayer notebook, which I keep on a computer, I have been working very hard and very intentionally in this area of giving God thanks. Recently, I started a new prayer of thanks to God, and it goes something like this. I wrote it down here. God, I thank you for allowing me to go through trials and problems of life. I realize that these are opportunities to trust you more, to depend on you more, and to become more like Jesus. So the idea, the instruction here of thanking God in all circumstances forces us to look at all circumstances and what God is teaching us in that moment. He's trying to make us more like Jesus Christ. If you attend on Wednesday night at our Wednesday night adult Bible study, you know that I always begin that Bible study with what? Thanks. I ask you, what are you thankful for? Name it out. Give your thanks and voice a thanks to God. So rather than just thinking about what can I get from God, what can I pray and ask for, we need to also give him thanks. That is a part of celebrating his presence. So I encourage you, make sure that you have a prayer notebook of some kind, maybe uh, a hard copy prayer notebook or on your computer, and in that, have a list of thanksgivings and write them down every day. At the end of our service today, we're gonna have a song that you know, it says, count your blessings, name them one by one. I'm telling you, don't just sing about it. Write them down. <laughs> Voice them out to God one by one, your thanksgivings. This is how we express our love and honor and respect to God. It's how we celebrate his presence. And then a fourth idea, the E. How are we to love God and celebrate his presence? The E stands for enjoy him. And this comes from 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we understand that we're to listen to God we're to be obedient to him. We're to voice out our thanks and praise to him. All of that makes sense. But this idea of enjoying God may not come as easy as you want it to. We know that in our physical relationships, we know what it means to enjoy a relationship with a spouse. We know what it means to enjoy a relationship with a child or a grandchild or a parent or a grandparent. That comes very easy to us. But the idea of enjoying a relationship with God who is spiritual takes another whole step of faith. And some of us, perhaps, maybe you were brought up in a very strict and legalistic Christian environment, and the whole idea of enjoying God is taboo to you. 
Yeah, I'm going to fear God, I'm going to obey God, but enjoy God? How do I do that? What does that really mean? This verse here tells us that God fills us with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because we're receiving the goal of our faith. What is the goal of our faith? The salvation of our soul. To be like Jesus, to be in heaven. God is giving that to us each and every day and he fills us with inexpressible and glorious joy and he wants us to enjoy the relationship with him. I'm reminded of when my son Murray was very young. We lived in Virginia at the time and oftentimes late in the afternoon we would go outside in the yard and play. And we played all kinds of games. We made up all kinds of games. But it was kind of my special time to spend with him rather than the rest of the family. And sometimes we just ended up chasing each other all around the house and the yard. And I can still hear my son laughing so hard when he was playing with me. He was having so much fun and enjoying his relationship with me that his only expression was laughter. I'm too old to run around in the yard now, so we don't do that anymore. But I remember that very vividly, how much we enjoyed that time and that relationship together. This past week, I had the opportunity to take some time off from church here and, and the work, and we went down to visit my dad. I have shared with some of you that my dad is dying with prostate cancer. He had it years ago and overcame it. Now the cancer has come back. It is spreading to his body. And even though he's on medication, he's gotten very frail, very weak, um, and just not able to get around. Thankfully, my two older sisters are in the house with him, caring for him. And I think that's helping him day by day. And what's really strange about it is that my father is a medical doctor, has been a medical doctor. His, his favorite subject was chemistry, so he has a chemist mind. So he knows exactly what's going on in his body. He knows exactly what the medication is doing to him. He can explain it scientifically, but there's nothing he can do about it. Even though he understands it chemically and scientifically, but there's nothing he can do to overcome it. And as we were there for a short time, I went into my dad's bedroom. He's sitting in his chair, and I knelt down beside him. And I just wanted to cry because I know how much pain he's going through, and yet there's nothing he can do about it. And he's a doctor. He can't stop it. There's nothing he can do. And I know that he won't live much longer, but I told him I loved him, and I told him um, I was sorry for the way he was feeling. And it brought back a flood of memories of enjoying a relationship with a parent. That we identify with. But what about God? How, how do we have that same enjoyment with God who is spiritual? We can't reach out and touch. We can't see his face. We can't hold his hand. But yet, we know he's with us all the time. So what does that look like to enjoy a relationship with God? One thing I've learned in my relationships with other people is that the more willing I am to be intimate with someone, to spend a lot of time with them, to get to know them, to be around them a lot, then the greater level of joy there is in that relationship. And that's the only way I can think about enjoying a relationship with God is that more, the more willing I am to spend time with him, time in his word, time praying, time just being still before God, then I know my enjoyment level will also increase and I will be able to enjoy him. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to celebrate his presence? It means that even though we can't see him, we love him and we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We are receiving the goal of our faith the salvation of our souls. I encourage you, you want to love God? Then spend time with him and learn to enjoy that relationship with him. Based on these scriptures that we've looked at today, here's my invitation to you. Will you make a commitment to celebrate God's presence? 
We've looked at some very practical ways of doing that, something that you can obey, something that you can start new this year. Maybe one of these ideas sparks an interest in you and you begin to practice that, put it into practice for this new year. Maybe as we read these scriptures, something else came to mind, a way that you can celebrate God's presence. But as we gather here every Sunday, and as you gather in your homes together or by yourself, make sure that you are celebrating the very presence of God. This is why we are here. This is what we are to do. And by the way, when you die and go to heaven, what do you think you're going to do in heaven? You're going to celebrate the presence of God. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you. Thank you for this simple command to love you with our entire being. Thank you for putting us here together in Flowery Branch as a congregation, as your church. And thank you that we can gather any time we desire to worship you, to love you, and celebrate your presence. Today, on this New Year's Day, we make a fresh commitment that this year we are going to do that. We're going to celebrate your presence. We're going to make sure that we accomplish this every week and every day in our homes, when we're driving down the road, when we're visiting with other people, when we have fellowship together, we want to celebrate your presence and express our love to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us so clearly what our purpose is and why we are here on this earth. We make this our commitment in Jesus' name. Amen.